to see you. Nice, really nice to uh, to share and to spend at the first Baptist Sunday with you. So many memories when you when you come to a service on Mother's Day. And each of us have got those very special moments. So it's really good when we can come together as a church and think back. Lots of good memories. Sometimes things that we should have said that we didn't. But let's, let's just... Um, think, if you've got a church Bible, we're going to be looking at um, particularly a part of a letter. So if you've got a church Bible, it's page 1179. It's Philippians chapter 2. And we're just going to read a few of the opening verses there uh, to make a start. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 19, uh, page 1179 in the church Bible. Here we go. Verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Verse 20. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon, but I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphrodites. You must have really struggled when I went to school like kid, didn't you? To, to write that, and uh, I struggled with Philip. <laughs> Epaphroditus my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs for he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill indeed he was ill and almost died but God had mercy on him and not on him only but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow therefore I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honour men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help. You could not give me. Notice that last little phrase. A bit of a sharp retort from a guy in a, in a prison cell, sort of just saying, you know, he came but you didn't. We are going to just make a few comments in chapter 3 up to verse 11. Not chapter 11, as Alec mentioned in the notices, but we're, uh, we're just going to, uh, to open that um, together. We'll just put the first slide up, John, as we, uh, as we look at this, and then we'll take it on there. Okay. I realise, as I talk to you as a church, some of you slightly younger in age, will not understand what a letter is. So I'm, I will try and explain that a little bit. Now there are those in our congregation have come with all sorts of reasons today. Some may be waiting uh, for a letter from um, the local council regarding maybe going too fast on a particular road um, recently. Those letters are not nice to get. I have a way of dealing with letters. My wife will um, sort of back me up on this a little bit. Um, I like to look at them unopened. No, no, it's, it's, it's a failing. I know, I know that. I like to, um, and then I look at the postmark, and I and I say to Elaine, "This and it's really a noise." 
um, sort of people in the family, and I'll say, that's from Durham. <coughs> we don't know anybody in Durham. And somebody will be saying, just open, but then there's a brown letter. And I have three or four of those that, that now I will, I will open. But letters. This is a, a letter written to a group of people. So for you younger ones, when I was 16, The person I am now married to was really good at writing a letter. And we've still got some of these letters knocking about. And wow, <coughs> were they special? That was a letter I wanted to open straight away. I was just like that. I was just, uh, <laughs> does she like me? I must confess that I wasn't as good a letter writer and I used to get a friend at work to help me. <laughs> Bill, Bill Dolby, um, he was magic. Until I we went out for a meal, and then he came out with this verse that was in my letter. I thought, oh, wow. Oh, wow. So there you go, letters. So what I'm trying to say, it's not just wasted time. What I'm trying to say is this. This is a letter that we've read this morning. And for some people in church, you've never read this part of the Bible before, I would suggest. You've never opened it because it just seems words, uh, a guy with a long name, um, and it's really not much to do with... Let's, let's focus on this letter and try and open it as a church together. So last week, Alec brought to us the high watermark of this letter. A letter to the church at Philippi. It was about... Um, being under the name of the Lord Jesus. It was about Jesus making himself nothing and becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And it's, it mentioned that every knee should bow in heaven or upon earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that was a, a fantastic part of the letter to, to, to give an example of what Jesus did for us. This part of the letter is what we can do for Jesus. So imagine this letter has got your name on it. Whatever your circumstances, whatever you're going through or been through, this letter has got your name on it. This particular part of the letter seems to contain some very mundane information about sending Timothy and Epaphroditus back to the church at Philippi. It almost seems like a travel schedule for them. And you think, what on earth, what on earth has that got to do with me today? But Paul uses it to illustrate the truth that he's been teaching already in chapter 1 and chapter 2. If you go online at some point and look up St. Bede's Episcopal Church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I found this interesting. Above the door into the sanctuary there is a hand-lettered sign which says, Servant's Entrance. There isn't a way in or a way out of the church unless you go through the Servant's Entrance. I like that. I like that. Because we are called in this letter, if we follow the Lord Jesus, we are called to be a servant together. And we're going to try and unpack that um, a little bit. This letter is a reminder that every believer is called to serve the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Master. Mark chapter 10 verse 45 says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's go down to verse 19 and just open your Bible and just begin to see just what this has got to say for us. So Paul is just writing about the two men that's been helping him while he's been in this prison cell in Rome. And he says this, 
I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Verse 20. I have no one, I have no one, no one else like him. Imagine having someone like that. In your thoughts, maybe you can just think about somebody in the fellowship here, or somebody in your family, or somebody as a work colleague, and you say to yourself, there's just no one to replace him or her. There's no one like him. It's a high commendation. And he goes on to say, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. A genuine interest. So here's a test. Many of us, and it's lovely to do this, will say after the service, oh, it's been nice seeing you. And sometimes we go further than that. We say, and I'll see you, hope to see you next week. And sometimes we, this is where it gets a bit dodgy, we will say something like, and how's your week been? And as long as they say something briefly, oh, not bad, we're okay. But if we get a lecture and a dissertation about, then sometimes we, we sort of cool it and go to one side. This wasn't like Timothy. There was no one else like him. And he helped Paul in every situation. He took a genuine concern. He had a love that overcame adversity. He had a compassion that went the extra mile. He was a hand that you would want to hold. He was a person that you would want to have next to you in your life. I've often said to Elaine, um, I've got many acquaintances, but a very, very small number of people that I can ring or go to in the extreme difficulties of life. You might be the same. You might, you might have more than that. See, Paul uh, writes here, he didn't want to lose this extra special person, this guy who had a genuine interest in people's welfare. That meant he put other people first. And this is, a, Alex sort of entered into this a bit last week, but Paul endorses it again here. Putting other people first as a priority. People bring problems. We've got loads of them in church. I, I'm a problem. <laughs> and I, and I, and I know that. But human beings, we are, we are full of, of situations and adversity. And sometimes we offload on people. But here we've got an individual who had a genuine interest. And I want to challenge myself and yourself on that. The genuine interest that you've got for other people in this church family. The genuine interest. <coughs> he goes on to say the third thing about Timothy. He says this, that Timothy has proved himself. That word that opened up is, he's got caliber. <coughs> he's, he's willing to be there even when things are very difficult. When the Roman soldiers in the prison cell are just telling the nasty jokes. When, when even the friends of Paul are not writing, are not coming, are not visiting. Here is Timothy and he's proved himself. And he goes on to say in the next verse, as like a father to a son or a son to a father in serving in the gospel. When I, was, when I was quite young and asked to go out and take a, a meeting or a service, so, some of those were absolutely terrible. Um, I mean me, not, not the meetings were terrible. Uh, my, my word of um, trying to explain how Jesus loved people. But I, but I remember that I was asked to go, sometimes with my dad. And what you would do... Um, He'd say, right, Philip, I want you to uh, give out the first hymn. I want you to open in prayer. 
And then you can sit there. I was so nervous, I was so uh, anxious of all these people, these learned people in church. I tripped over my words as I prayed. But this was my first little journey into being in partnership with my dad in the gospel. Only very small steps. I was terrified when after three or four times my dad would say to me, can you give a word of testimony for me? You see, I now know that I was privileged to be brought up in a Christian home. By that I mean that my mum and dad loved the Lord Jesus. I know that's not the same for everybody. And there were times when I moaned because I had to go to church sometimes when it was nice and sunny and I wanted cricket and football and, and other stuff. And I didn't like that. Well, I see others in church can, can maybe, you know, come alongside with me. But hang on to this. The things I picked up as I went to church week by week. The partnerships that people took me on board. Individuals throughout Yorkshire and Derbyshire and Lancashire who got to know me at different camps and just said, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. I want to encourage you. Timothy had proved himself. In the local church, as a missionary, but also in prison, he proved himself that he was someone you could trust and have alongside. How many people have you got like that? That'd be challenging. How many people have you got that you can say, I can trust that person for everything? He's got my genuine welfare at heart. So, Paul then begins to continue just um, talking about Timothy. And then in verse 25, he gets to this guy with a big name, Epaphrodites. <coughs> And he, and he goes on and he says this about Epaphrodites. Three beautiful things. So Epaphrodites had come from the church at Philippi. And it was a massive journey. And he'd come to Rome as a messenger to encourage Paul in prison. And he did a bit of shopping for him. And, and you can use your imagination, and he was there to maybe help wash clothes and, and things of that nature. But as you read down this chapter, you'll find out for yourselves that the people in the church at Philippi were missing him. And Epaphrodites um, was missing them. And he was a bit homesick. <coughs> identities, character references of this individual Epaphrodites. He says, first of all, um, he is my brother in Christ. In other words, he belongs to the family of God. He's got a faith. He belongs to the Lord Jesus. And what Paul is saying, I can see that in every aspect of his life. See, it's a good job that you don't see me every day of the week. I'm not particularly bad, but there are moments where it just slips. It just slips. And I, I, I often think to myself, I am so glad that Alec hasn't seen just what my mind was thinking just there. I am so glad that one or two in church who encourage me and, and some, t well they do, they, they pray for me. I am so glad that they just didn't catch that bit. Because they might not say that this brother in Christ, this fellow worker, that's what Paul is encouraging us to be today, to be servants, fellow workers. When there's something to do. I had a real encouragement on Friday. In, in, in the warming space and the Friday before we've got people who help um, make the breakfast and wash but a young lady who's here today she got stuck in with the dishes she's the fastest dishwasher <laughs> exponent 
this church has ever seen. She came to receive a breakfast and to have a kind word, but she ended up serving. What a privilege for me to serve with that young lady. In fact, one of our regular helpers said to me, um, she's that fast, I can't keep up with her. But the point is, she didn't need to be asked. She came into the situation and she got involved. What, what a beautiful thing that is. That's what faith, that's what a fellow worker is. That's what a fellow soldier is. A fellow worker is someone who's getting their hands dirty, working through the hard times, working even when illness overtakes him. This guy in the letter, it says he got poorly and he almost died. It doesn't mean that, oh well, he just had a heavy cold and he was, he was nearly dead. And yet God restored him and he restored Paul. And he became not only a fellow worker and a brother in Christ, but a fellow soldier. You see, when you become a fellow soldier, do you know what that means? It means that when the battle is raging, and Satan is warring a battle, if you're going through addiction problems, if you're going through uh, anything of that, that nature, that, that is so hard to, to deal with. And I don't understand much about it, but I recognise it's so hard to deal with. A fellow soldier is someone who comes and stands alongside you. And he understands, or they understand a little bit of what you're going through. I remember going to visit an individual who'd got a young girl pregnant and he was a Christian in a church. I remember going to see him and the comments I got from fellow Christians were horrific. They were horrific. You don't go there. You should, and all, all kinds of, they meant well. I went down to that individual's house and I played very badly, but I played snooker with him. And it meant something because we were fellow soldiers together. Even in his adversity, even in his sin, even in his problems, even in, even in his difficulties. You see, this Epaphroditus, he signed up for service. He was willing to travel on behalf of his local church. And you'll find if you read the end of this last verse in chapter 2, you'll find out that Paul just puts this little bit in. Well, some of you didn't, you know, didn't want to come and see him. He didn't want to help. But Epaphroditus made it. He made the journey. You might know people that's gone out to Ukraine taking food in our, in our local area. I've thought about it. I didn't do it. They thought about it and did it. It's action. Love. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the answer to help... Uh, to get into that situation. We need to sign up for service so that we're in the place God wants us to be. That's not just in this church. But have you thought about how you can serve God in this local church? I live too far away. Um, I, I'm working out. I, I'm just, I, I know. But there's something that you can do. There's something that you can get, you can get a, a, alongside with and fight and help in the battle. An old illustration. The brush with lots of bristles in. And when we're sweeping against the, the evil of Satan, when we're sweeping the dark things out of the way, when, there's, when all, the, all the bristles on the brush and all the people in the church are in it together, it makes, it makes the work encouraging. It makes the work successful. But when there's some of the bristles missing, or some of the people not able to serve or not able to help, through good reasons often, then sometimes the workload can be a real burden. Be encouraged. Let's move on very, very quickly. Verse 29. 
Welcome, Evaphroditus, in the Lord with great joy. Honour men like him because he took risks to help me. He risked his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. Life was at the very lowest point for Paul, for Timothy, for Epaphroditus. But when, when God came through in his mercy, there was a little ray of sunshine that, that lifted them up. Just for the last few verses, and we'll, and we'll just go over it in a couple of minutes, you turn over to chapter 3. All I've put down from, from my last slide are the words of the, the Song of the Servant King. The first verse and the last verse that Rob and the music team played so well for us today. What Paul says in, the, in his last few verses um, is very strong, very harsh. He says, finally my brothers rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and again. It is a safeguard for you. And in the, in the next five verses, he talks about a group of people who were called Judaizers. They were Jews, and they were following the Lord Jesus, but they still wanted to keep their old stuff, their old baggage. They believed in circumcision. And they were challenging people who... Um, who Paul was speaking to and they, and they were saying things like you're not a proper Christian if you don't do this as well <coughs> and I think all I want to say about this is that Paul is, is saying to us don't get drawn into stuff don't get drawn away from following Jesus sometimes people get married um, and they they don't become as regular at church because because of that relationship. They still like and love God, but they don't, they don't somehow see God in the same way. Paul is saying here, he's learnt how to count. He talks about loss. And he talks about gain. And he says to people, I was the best Jew there was. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was taught under Gamaliel. And what he recognises is this, but that that was just a loss because I thought I could do it in my own strength he said I want, I want, I want you to realise you people and in verse 8 he goes on to it he said I, want, I just want to know Christ verse 8 he says again I want to gain Christ verse 9 I want to be found in Christ and what he's really saying is this in verse 9 I want a righteousness of my own not a righteousness of circumcision in the Old Testament, as a tra tradition, but what Paul says, I want a circumcision of the heart, a righteousness at the cross, where the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he shed his blood for your sin and for my sin. I was only a youngster when I, when I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to go in, into my life and into my heart, and he's never left me, he's never deserted me. I have done things that are still wrong, but he's forgiven me. Verse 10, as we finish, he says this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. You know what some people say? I want to get married. That's, that's brilliant. I, I want a new job. That's fantastic. Sometimes people say, I want a new life. Sometimes we'll say, I want a new start. All those things are really admirable to, to think about. But what Paul reminds them is this. He says, the only thing you, need, you want is that you want to know Christ and his righteousness. And that he died on the cross. And that today that he loves you. In whatever condition you are in, he loves you. And he wants to forgive you. And the best thing... He wants you to join his family. We've got all sorts in this church. Old guys. People, guy, uh, people who think they're funny. When they're not. <laughs> no, no, but we have. And it, it's, it's fantastic. You know, I wouldn't maybe choose 
to have loads of you people and love that you are as, as best mates. But God's got other ideas. He'd be as. He, he's a fun God. And he wants today, he wants you to come into his family. And all you have to do, but it's a big thing, is to say, Lord Jesus, would you forgive my sin? And would you come and live in my life? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. <coughs> when we pray, we don't have to speak out loud. God in heaven knows what you're thinking. And if you want forgiveness today for things that you've done in your life, for, th for situations that are beyond your control, just ask the Lord Jesus to come and ju just to live in, just within your life just now. Make room for him. <coughs> throw the rubbish out. That's what Paul did. Just throw the rubbish out. He'll give you the power and the strength to overcome the problems that you've got. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. Just where you are, just where you sat, just say, Lord Jesus, I've made such a mess. And I keep on making a mess. Would you please just come and forgive me and just, just, just stay in my life. And just help me to make the right choices and the right decisions. Lord Jesus, I want to go to heaven to be with you. Please, I want to place my trust in you today. Amen. Amen.